Good morning. morning. Welcome to this Sunday's worship service. We'll begin with the silent prayer, followed by a representative prayer by Shepherd Robert Hagen. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your understanding through revelation. Because of your marvelous uh, deeds, we have came to experience uh, the blood of the the Lamb and have been cleansed and have become your people. Now as we live in this world, we can see that you want us to repent daily and even hourly for cleansing so that we can maintain our love relationship with you. We also also learned that you want to purify us with with fire. So we pray that no matter how great the situations are in our life, when we are pushed to the corner, we may not compromise, but we may keep our faith in God. In this way, we can come to have so many beautiful encounters with you and can sing real songs of real songs of praise. May we be victorious over the world like those who ended up in heaven through martyrdom. Lord, may you bless our spring semester as we continue to serve your work. But in spirit, may you go with us and, and, and save many souls. Lord, help us to fulfill our prayer topic of 400 one-to-one Bible studies and 200 disciples. We also, Lord, uh, we pray that uh, you may put an end to all wars and continue to support those in need in Turkey and uh, uh, in Syria and Morocco. Lord, be with your servants, uh, mission, uh, missionary Kiangi, uh, sir. May you uh, bring complete healing to our knees as she continues to exercise them. Please uh, be with uh, Dr. James, uh, sir. May his immune system remain strong after chemo. Lord, and we also uh, pray for Dr. Hong's healing that uh, he may uh, that he would uh, he would he would have uh, not not have any uh, complications after having the surgery. Please restore all of them so that they may continue to serve your work. We pray we pray that uh, you will continue uh, to uh, bring comfort to Sarah Flores, uh, uh, for Sarah Flores and her and her family. We also uh, pray for Jessica Flores' mother and Eileen's father that they would be completely healed and even have that chance to hear and believe in the gospel. Please today, Lord, may you be with your precious servant, Missionary John. May you really empower him with your Holy Spirit to to serve your message today. And may we come to really understand your message and receive it very personally. May you bless this worship service from the beginning to the end. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now sing hymn 338.
Bibles to Revelation chapter 16. That's Revelation chapter 16, and we'll read verses 1 through 21 responsively. Okay, I'll go first. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. And cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. <coughs> now we'll have a message by Missionary John Beck. Hi, everyone. Yeah, welcome to this worship service. The title of today's message is Seven Bowls with the Seven Bo- uh, Seven Angels with the Seven Bowls of God's Wrath. The key verses are verses 5 and 6. Let's read these verses uh, together. <clears throat> Let's go. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much for uh, granting us this chance to study the book of Revelation. Our Father, may you strengthen us, Lord, that we may... uh, uh, as we uh, uh, understand uh, your message in this book, we may really put what we learned into uh, practice so that we all may be ready for Jesus' second coming any moment. May you bless our worship service today with your holy presence from the beginning to the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
First, you are just in these judgments. Look at verses 1 and 2. Let's read these verses responsibly. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's rest on the earth. The first bowl plague was targeted at those who had the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast was for everything they did in their day-to-day -day life. Buying cars, houses, paying the rent for their apartments, buying, their, uh, buying uh, uh, groceries, buying airplane tickets, subway, uh, 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 subway and bus fare. Uh, for, all, uh, for roll call in schools and classes. It was their driver's license, social security number, credit cards, and bank account all combined. It was their employee ID, and it was indeed everything for them. So they used it many times <laughs> each and every day. Then maybe after using it, uh, many times every day for one or two years, suddenly it began to cause these uh, painful sores uh, that are mentioned. These people were not active leaders in rebellion against God, but they just followed the trend for survival, ignoring the warnings of God. Thus they chose whose side they would stand on, the side of the beast. So far, they had survived throughout the tribulation, but now God's wrath was poured out on them. Look at verse 3. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. The second angel pulled out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The second bowl, uh, second bowl uh, plague is focused on the sea. When the second angel pulled out his bowl on the sea, it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The sea is the main part of the ecosystem of the earth. Because of the sea, water, uh, because of the sea, water evaporates into the air, travels uh, to the land, and comes down as rain, reviving life. This big body of water absorbs the solar energy. As a result, the temperature on the earth does not go into the extremes. But when the sea does not uh, function properly in this ecosystem, the whole earth suffers terribly. In some areas, it, uh, it is extremely hot, while some other areas are extremely cold. Water does not circulate throughout the earth properly any longer, and large <laughs> desert areas will spread quickly. When the sea dies, when all the living things in the sea die, the sea will stink so badly. And all kinds of environmental problems will occur. And this will cause all kinds of health problems for the people. Right now, we can go to Homosa Beach and enjoy nice scenery there. Houses located near the beaches are super expensive. But things will change completely when the sea dies, when the water of the sea becomes blood. Human life will not be the same any longer. It will be really miserable. The real problem is that once the waters, waters of the sea become blood, it is impossible to turn it back to water again because there is no way to process so much water 
and make it clean in the world. Too much water. It is irreversible. When the sea dies this way, the only thing that is left for humans on the earth is to suffer all the way until they die. Indeed, this plague alone can be considered the end of everything. Look at verses 4 to 7. Let's read these verses responsibly. <clears throat> Let me go first. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. The third bowl was poured out on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. So people could not drink from them. And of course, had to figure out a way to extract water from blood. As a result, water then probably became very scarce and very expensive. Maybe a, a several hundred dollars for a 16 ounce a water bottle. Think about people drinking water that is extracted from blood. Do you want to drink such, uh, such water? Probably not. When there is no fresh water, human life will be really miserable. Water is so expensive. Then what about taking shower? It's very, very difficult. This will happen to all people's owners. At this, the angel in charge of the waters said, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. God is here described as you who are and who were, indicating that God was the one who had watched them killing his prophets and saints, both in the Old Testament period and in the New Testament period. Now, finally, at this time, God took vengeance on them by having them drink blood. Look at verses 8 and 9. Let's read these verses responsibly. The fourth angel pulled out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with the fire. <clears throat> the fourth angel pulled out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with the fire. They were seared by the intense heat. Maybe with this plague, there was a hypersolar flare, solar flare, that caused intense heat on the Earth. Or the ozone zone in the atmosphere of the Earth was removed so that people were exposed to ultraviolet uh, rays, ultraviolet UV rays directly. The word seared is used for uh, steaks. When you cook steaks, <laughs> when you cook steak, you need to sear it. This is a secret. <laughs> you need to sear it, browning it quickly under very high heat so that the Maillard reaction can occur. Under high heat, the amino acids and sugars undergo a chemical reaction, creating a flavorful crust on the surface of the meat, <laughs> while keeping the inside juicy and tender. It's so good then. <laughs> Searing is certainly a word used for steaks, not for humans. 
Think about the situation. As soon as you go outside and expose yourself to the sun, you are seared and, uh, and get a third degree burn. When the sun is so hot like this, humans will not be able to go outside of the building any longer during the day. Uh, during the day. Instead, they have to stay inside. They will become like vampires. <laughs> so no more football or soccer or traveling or jogging by the beach. Human life will be so restricted and miserable. The sea becomes blood, causing all kinds of terrible environment, environmental hazards. Instead of fresh water, people have to drink water that has been extracted from blood. They cannot go outside at all because the sun is too hot. All people's owners will be in big trouble. Indeed, God pours out his wrath on the people of the earth. So make sure that you will not be the object of God's wrath. These four plagues are very closely related to the plagues God inflicted on uh, the Egyptians through Moses. Moses turned the water of the Nile into uh, blood. When Moses took soot from a furnace and tossed it into the air, festering boils broke out on men and animals. The ninth plague was total darkness, meaning that the sun did not function at all. And all of Egypt was in darkness for three days. In chapter 15, we see these seven angels coming out of the, the, the tabernacle of the testimony, showing that these seven plagues would be done based on the terms and conditions of the testimony, the Old Testament. So the same kind of plagues were inflicted on the people of the world for their sins, indicating that those who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus will be judged according to God's laws in the Old Testament. While we studied this passage in a group, someone asked me about believers during this period of time. Then, Another day, after Bible study was over, another disciple asked me the same thing. Will there be believers during this time of the, uh, during this time of the seven world plagues? Will believers suffer also from these seven plagues? What do you think? These are special uh, uh, judgment of God arranged for the people of the world. Will believers also suffer from these plagues? It sounds really, it is a really good question. Eh? We must think about it. In order to understand it, we need to see the whole picture of the book of Revelation with believers in mind. Even before the Antichrist rises to power, a lot of believers will suffer martyrdom. When the Lamb opens the fifth seal, so many believers will be killed, and they will cry out to God, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then, after the sixth seal was opened, there will be Israel's nationwide uh, conversion to God in Jesus. And as a result, 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be established. And through their evangelical work, multitudes of people will believe in Jesus Christ. So there will be many Christians in the world again. First, Martyr, the group of martyr, great martyrdom, a lot of Christians are killed. And then, through 144,000 Jewish evangelists, there will be many Christians in the world again. 
and they will be also killed. These people come to heaven wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And still there will be many Christians in the world preaching the gospel. Then the Antichrist will rise to power and start his persecution against Christians in the world during the second half of the seven-year covenant. His purpose is to kill all of them and remove God's name from the surface of the earth. So the 144,000 Jewish evangelists will be killed and they will appear in heaven together with Jesus. After this, most of the saints will be harvested through martyrdom. Uh, martyrdom. That's what Revelation chapter 14 uh, talks about. So, by the beginning of the seventh ball place, by the beginning of the seventh ball place, the majority of Christians will have been harvested through martyrdom. Yet still, they will be God's people on earth. As the Apostle Paul mentioned, when Jesus comes again, those who were dead in Christ will rise first and meet him in the air. Then those who are still alive, saints who are still alive, will uh, meet him in the air. So still there will be Christians. One group of God's people are the saints who have not been killed by the Antichrist. They will do God's work continually preaching the gospel, enduring all sufferings and difficulties. Some of them will be arrested and killed, but those who are not killed to the end will see Jesus coming again. Most likely, they will be raptured and meet Jesus in the air. Another group of the saints are the Jews in nuclear bunkers. They will be taken care of uh, for three and a half years, the second uh, the half of the seven-year covenant. I think that these Jews are Jewish Christians uh, who accepted Jesus as their savior. They will be protected from these seven poor plagues. Then they will go into the millennium. There will be another group of God's people. Who are they? Another group of God's people. Some Catholics who sincerely love God without knowing the true identity of Roman Catholicism. As of this time, that religion will be still there in the world without being persecuted. Maybe that religion will be really popular in the whole world. Because Christianity is persecuted and Christians are killed, but the people who belong to Roman Catholicism will not be bothered at all. In chapter 18, she will be destroyed. But before her destruction, God encourages them saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. As these saints are, the, are there as members of the Roman Catholic Church, they will, as, they, uh, uh, as these saints, uh, uh, yeah, as these saints are there as uh, members of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, they will also suffer from these seven poor plagues. When they come out of their religion, a lot of them will be killed. But those who have survived will see Jesus coming, and most likely they will go into the millennium also. Second, the peace kingdom uh, is uh, uh, darkened, and the kingdom of the whole world uh, gathered at, uh, gathered at Amagetan. Look at verses, uh, verse 10. Let's read this verse together. Verse 10. Let's go. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. 
men gnawed their tongues in agony. The fierce bowl of God's wrath was targeted at the Antichrist government. When the fifth angel pulled out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his kingdom was weakened. Because of the previous four, four plagues, even the world dominant government of the beast could not control the people of the world properly. Their economy was destroyed. People's day to day life was restricted completely, and the government could not provide anything properly food, water, air, or protection. Thus, people most likely began to complain, starting riots and rebellions and resistance movement against the government. People in the world would not honor and respect the beast any longer. Before, they worshipped the, uh, the beast, but no more. Suddenly, the kingdom of the beast was weakened greatly. This passage shows that the angel pulled out the fifth ball on the throne of the beast. Then, as a result, his kingdom was plunged into darkness, indicating that there was a certain trigger. Yes, indeed, because of the previous plagues, his kingdom was weakened. And it was out of control. Then there was a trigger that plunged this kingdom into darkness. What might be that trigger? What do you think? What might be, what event you know, can be the trigger that plunged the, the beast kingdom into darkness? During Bible study, one disciple suggested uh, uh, that uh, all their computer network, internet network, the network uh, the crash, uh, uh, crashes and then uh, they go back to the storm age. <laughs> he suggests that uh, there might be some kind of uh, EMP attack. So all computer system uh, uh, is down and then they cannot do anything. Anyway, we don't know yet. Until it happens. Something will happen. Anyway, at the fifth ball plague, something happened. And the beast kingdom was plunged into darkness. Look at verses 10b and 11. Let's read these verses together. Uh, starting from, men nod their tongues. Okay. Let's go. Men nod their tongues in agony and curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. These verses show us their response to the bold place. The expression, men nod their tongues in agony, shows that due to the plagues, their life was so miserable that they beat their tongues in agony. Also the expression, because of their pains and their sores. Their sores. When did it happen? At the first ball plague. Their sores popped up. So happened. But here, the expression, because of their pains and their sores, shows that these plagues were not just a one-time occurrence. That happened just one time and a few weeks later it disappeared. It was not like that. Instead, these uh, uh, plagues lasted throughout the, uh, throughout the others. It means that the sea remained as a blood. They still suffered from sores. And the sun was still unbearably hot. All peoples on earth were suffering really terribly. Indeed. God's wrath was poured out on them. But they refused to repent of what they had done. Instead, they cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. This shows that they recognized that these plagues 
were not just natural disasters, but the result of God's wrath on them. Yet still, they refused to repent, showing that they were really bad, were fully determined to not turn to God no matter what. All peoples on earth were like this. At the same time, this statement shows God's desire to see people still repenting and turning to him. Even when his final judgment is going on, God's desire is for people to repent and live. Look at verse 12. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. This sixth bowl plague is about the preparation for the war in Armageddon. This passage suggests that until this time, the water of the great river Euphrates had been the obstacle or a barrier that was uh, uh, blocking the kings, the armies from the east, from marching to Israel. But then, at the sixth spoil plague, because the water dried up, they could uh, move forward. But when you think about, uh, about this uh, realistically, it does not make any sense at all that because of the water of the Euphrates River, the armies of the kings from the east are detained on the east side of the river. You know, even uh, 2,000 years ago, what, 3,000 years ago, when the, uh, the river was uh, uh, bothering them, the army just uh, uh, stopped, uh, changed the course of, uh, of the river, or they uh, built a dam up uh, there and blocked the uh, streams uh, from uh, flowing. That's what they did. Even 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, that's what they did. What about today? Yes. They can cross, it, uh, cross the river freely, very quickly with uh, help from uh, big boats or some specialized equipments. Certainly, armies can cross any river very quickly. So we can see that this water of the Euphrates River is not real water. Then, what does this water of the Euphrates refer to? In Revelation chapter 12, when the Jews were fleeing to the nuclear bunkers, the dragon spewed water from his mouth to overtake them. But the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the water. There, the water that uh, 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 came out of the mouth of the dragon refers to many people, many soldiers. In chapter 17, we see the adulterous woman who was sitting on many waters. An angel gave the Apostle John the interpretation of many waters she sat on, saying, The waters you saw where the prostitutes sit are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Likewise, here the water of the Euphrates River that has blocked their passage to Israel refers to peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. What kind of people? In my opinion, I think what I think is right. In my opinion, they are Islamic countries uh, located in that area, not allowing other people and army to pass through their countries. Why would they do so? Most likely because of religious or political reasons. Right now, Israel is the enemy of all Islamic countries. The, uh, 
Israel is a tiny country surrounded by many hostile Islamic countries, yet they do not attack Israel altogether. Why? It is because they are divided among themselves due to different perspectives about who should be the, the successor of Muhammad, their prophet. At least 87% of Muslims are Sunnis. They are the majority in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Yemen, Pakistan, Indonesia, Turkey, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. The uh, Shi'is are the majority in Iran, Iraq, and Bahrain. It seems that they hate each other more than they hate Israel. So, even though Israel is their enemy, they do not fight with Israel, but they fight with each other. But during the last days, if these branches of Islam reconcile with each other and become united, then they may agree to march to Israel altogether. Or simply, during the latter part of the last days, the Islamic power will weaken so that such religious or political conflicts disappear in the world, in the Middle East, and the armies from the East can freely march toward Israel. Which do you think is the right scenario? Maybe either way. Huh? Here we see the expression, the kings from the East indicating that many armies from countries located in the east will march toward Israel. What countries? Some Christians just casually say China, but China will be just one of the countries that will join in this war. Let's check out the map. The Euphrates River flows through uh, Syria and uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, that it goes down all the way to the, uh, to the Persian uh, 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 Gulf here. But the main one is here uh, the, uh, the Syria and uh, uh, Iraq. From there, the east, uh, east, Iran. Uh, Turkmenistan, and then Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, maybe Kazakhstan, I don't know, uh, and then Mongolia, Nepal, China, Korea, and Japan. These are the, the uh, countries in the East. Uh, many or actually, all of these countries will send their armies to Armageddon. Look at verses 13 and 14. Let's read these verses responsibly. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. These verses show that not only the armies from the east, but also many other countries in the whole world will join in this war. How many countries in the world uh, will join in this uh, uh, war, uh, Armageddon? What do you think? How many countries? Right now, let's say there is 220 countries. 220, how many will join in this world? Maybe 100? Maybe 150? I think, I think. All the countries will join in this world. I don't want Korea to join in this world. 
<laughs> I love my country. But uh, as of that time, all Christians, most Christians are, are killed already. And then the, so the, the government will be operated by ungodly people completely. That will be the situation of all the countries in the whole world. They, they are the ones that, who, uh, that supported, uh, they are the ones who, who supported the uh, Antichrist. So when this happened, most likely all the countries in the whole world will join in this war at Armageddon. Also, uh, uh, remember that all peoples on earth are so bad that God punishes them with the seven poor plagues. When the absolute majority of nations in the whole world stand on the side of Satan by sending their armies to Armageddon, then when Jesus comes and destroys them at Armageddon, it will be indeed the time of God's judgment on all peoples on earth. The word Armageddon in Hebrew means plain of Megiddo. The place called Megiddo is located between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea in the north of Israel. Let's check out the map. Armageddon, Armageddon the plain of Megiddo is important. This is the Mediterranean Sea and this is uh, the Sea of Galilee and the uh, Dead Sea. The plain of Megiddo is here, here. To this place, all the armies will gather. Third, behold, I come like a thief. Look at verse 15. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Here Jesus proclaims his second coming, saying, Behold, I come like a thief. This is actually Jesus' warning toward all God's people. Implying that we must live our life with his second coming in mind. Don't just live your life casually or do whatever you feel like doing. Instead, live your life in a manner worthy of his coming. That's what Jesus means when he says, Behold, I come like a thief. Jesus comes at an unexpected time. When everyone thinks that it is not the right time, he will come. So, we must be alert in spirit so that his coming may not be like a thief breaking into our house. At the same time, when you think about Jesus talking about his, his second coming at this moment, we can see one thing very clearly. What can you see? One thing very clearly. Jesus here says, Behold, I come like a thief. Mm. Then it is very clear that by this time, Jesus has not come yet. That one thing is very clear. Even at the sixth sport plague, Jesus has not come yet. Instead, at the sixth sport plague, Jesus encourages all Christians to prepare themselves properly for his coming so that we will not be exposed to shame at his coming. So when others say it differently, don't be confused. Just simply see what Jesus says in the Bible. With this proclamation, Jesus tells us how we must prepare ourselves for his coming, saying, Blessed is he 
who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Christians are very casual about Jesus' second coming, saying, oh, when he comes, I'll be raptured. But Jesus shows us who will be really blessed, those who do the things Jesus here suggests. Jesus encourages all Christians to do two things. This is Jesus' instruction. And at the same time, he's warning for all Christians. If we don't do what he tells us here, then there is great danger that we'll go naked and thereby be shamefully exposed at his second coming. Do you want to be shamefully exposed as terrible sinners at Jesus' second coming? Definitely not. Then do these two things. The first thing we Christians must do as we wait for his, coming, his second coming is to stay awake in spirit. Let's say stay awake loudly, okay? One, two, three. Stay awake. That's the first thing. Stay awake. Staying awake is different from once in a while you pick up some spiritual desire for God. Once in a while, even terrible sinners want to go to church. <laughs> Christmas comes, they feel guilty. So they come to Christmas worship service. And then the next time, Easter. <laughs> Once in a while, people decide to attend church worship service and even there, even they shed tears. Then the following week, they feel burdened and do not come to church any longer. Jesus is not talking about that kind of thing. Instead, staying awake means you sincerely seek God continually, doing all your Christian duties, such as attending worship service faithfully, reading and studying the Bible regularly, and then securing your fellowship with God through prayer, striving to do what God wants you to do. You are Staying awake means you are keenly aware of what you do and how you live your life as a Christian. You go that way continually. Simply means you seek God in your day-to-day -day life consciously. You know what you are doing. You intentionally seek God. That's how you live as real Christians. Jesus mentions about Christians staying awake. It means that unless we are careful about this, and unless we make conscious efforts, very easily we fail to stay awake as Christians. We totally understand this. While we live as Christians, even while we wait for his second coming, while we talk about our vision of being raptured, still very easily, many Christians become complacent and casual, becoming dull in spirit. Often they fall into spiritual slumber, not being sensitive to their spiritual condition, not responsive to the things of God. They just go through the motions. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus specifically mentions this, saying, Be careful. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Be careful, or 
your hearts will be weighed down. You are so concerned. You are so bothered about those things. That way, then you fail to stay awake. That's what happens. So we need to be very careful. Instead of talking about being raptured, Christians must talk about how they should stay awake in spirit. We Christians should talk about what we must do to stay awake each and every day so that we'll be able to welcome him when he comes again. So, what should we do? There are things you must not do, I will tell you. We must not do. Don't spend too much time watching YouTube videos. <laughs> That's something we must not do. So many Christians are very sensitive to what YouTube videos suggest. In that way, they stay awake to YouTube videos. <laughs> Many Christians stay awake in regard to politics, being angry, or cheering their favorite politicians on, but they do not show that kind of uh, 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 enthusiastic response to the things of God. So many Christians delve into conspiracy, many conspiracy theories, carefully searching and analyzing all the facts, statistics, and suggestions, spending so much time. They are very responsive to such things, sometimes getting angry in frustration, and sometimes being very fearful their perspectives and life are greatly influenced and controlled. These things are far more important and real and practical to them than the things of God. In that way, they stay awake in regard to those conspiracy theories. There are really many things that make God's people dull in spirit. Jesus mentions uh, mentions. The uh, dissipation. Don't live that kind of life. Dissipation. Drunkenness. Don't drink. The worries of this life. The worries. Oh my goodness, what shall I do? And so many, they are so bombarded. The worries and fears of this life. Intriguing knowledge or theories, hobbies, politics, stocks and coins relationships and human networks, etc. So many things. While they stay awake to those things, being very responsive, they just go through the motions of Christian life. Often, they think that by participating in those things, they are serving God. They are only deceiving themselves. No matter what, these things are mundane. God wants us to be holy, consecrated to him. Don't destroy yourself as a Christian with these things. Instead, watch out. Be very careful that you will not give your heart to these things. In that way, you will stay awake as a Christian. The second thing Jesus asks us to do is, to keep our clothes with us. Jesus says, Blessed is he who keeps his clothes with him. When you go to heaven, and if we are considered worthy, God will give us white clothes to wear, fine linen. These clothes God gives us will cover our nakedness and thereby will not be exposed to shame. This fine linen, these clothes that God will give us to cover our nakedness and shame is Jesus' righteousness. 
with righteousness, with Jesus' righteousness, we'll be covered. So we'll not be exposed as terrible sinners before God. But the clothes Jesus talks about here in verse 15 are not the clothes God will give us. Instead, Jesus says, Blessed is he who keeps his clothes with him. So these clothes are the clothes each Christian should prepare. It is your clothes which you will wear to cover your nakedness while you live here on the earth. If you keep your clothes with you, then you will wear it so that when Jesus comes again, he will see that you are not shamefully exposed. Jesus says that such people are blessed. What are these clothes about? You want to have these clothes, right? So what, is, what are these clothes, uh, clothes about? Revelation chapter 19 verse 8 says, Fine linen, bright and clean, was given, to, uh, given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. White clothes or fine linen refers to Jesus' righteousness that will cover our nakedness and shame. When we go to heaven, God will give it to us to wear. In the same way, the clothes we must keep with us refers to the righteous acts of the saints. This means that as we wait for Jesus' second coming, we must live the life of doing the righteous acts of the saints. This is what each and every Christian must do. Those who have lived that kind of life are the ones who keep their close with him when Jesus comes again. Oh, with them when Jesus comes again. So at Jesus' second coming, you will see them wearing their clothes and thereby not exposed to shame. Jesus will be happy with them. These people with the confidence and thanks you know, will be able to stand and welcome Jesus when he comes again. They will be just like the first and second servants in the parable, uh, in the parable of the talent and the parable of the mina. About this, Jesus says, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. God also says in Genesis chapter 4, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? That is how God sees everything. If you do what is right, of course God will accept you. And God asks, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. So what happens to those people? When they do not do what is right, positively, what happens to them? Sin is crouching at, at their door. So whenever they open the door, because they have to go to work, because they want to go out jogging, go jogging, then sin, like a lion, pounces on them and devours them. As a result, they live a sinful life. That is God's understanding. That's how God reveals what happens to people when they do not do what is right positively. Simply, as God's people, as we wait for Jesus' second coming, we must do what is right. God will certainly accept such people. This is what all Christians must do. Think about all Christians struggling to do what is right in their day-to-day -day life. Then you can see what Christian lifestyle is about. The lifestyle of doing 
What is right? All Christians do this all the time. That is what Christian life is about. Do what is right. And you will be able to stand before Jesus. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> verse 17. It reads, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. With the seventh bowl plague, God's wrath was completed. At this, what happened? Look at verses 18 through 21. Let's read these verses responsibly. 18 through 21. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on, on earth. So tremendous was the quake. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. Here the expression, flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder shows that Great power was launched as the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Great power, great energy was launched. Then a severe earthquake occurred on the earth. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. A similar earthquake occurred when Pelech was born as recorded in Genesis chapter 10. Before that time, the earth was one big continent, which later people called Pangaea. But in the year Pelag was born, there had been such a big earthquake that Pangaea split into several continents, just in the way today Google Maps shows. At that time, each continent moved so fast. Maybe at the uh, 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 at the 60 miles per hour. So that when people woke up, they found that they were right at the edge of cliffs. And their neighbors just had simply disappeared. It was such a big earthquake. Today's passage shows that the earthquake that did occur at the seventh pole plague is even greater than that. No wonder it says, every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. Also he says, the cities of the nations collapsed. Now you can understand these are very the, the realistic description when the earthquake is so big. So great. When this kind of big earthquake occurs, there will be volcanoes erupting everywhere on the earth. And as the smoke and ashes from those volcanoes go into the air, the whole world will be covered with smoke and ashes, blocking the sunlight. And it will be very cold and dark. Then the passage shows that huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each now fell upon men. When a volcanic eruption occurs, water evaporates very quickly, turns to ice in the air, and falls down as a hail. Hailstones uh, are very common after volcanic eruptions. It just naturally happens that way. But since volcanic eruptions will occur worldwide due to the big earthquake, each hailstone weighs about 100 pounds. If just one heavy hail 
large stone of 100 pounds falls from the sky, sky, then it would already be so powerful like a missile. 100 pounds of the hailstone falling from the sky all the way, you know, it becomes, uh, it comes, becomes like a um, uh, missile. Uh, just think about E equal MC squared. With that, that's what people wonder about the big earth, the, uh, the, uh, uh, some comet or uh, meteor may fall into the, on, onto, the, uh, onto the earth and it will uh, create a great explosion, that kind of things. Yes, when it is 100 pounds, it will cause big trouble, really. If anyone is hit by this hailstorm, what will happen to that person? That person will be really destroyed. Even if people stay home, these hailstone, uh, hailstones can destroy those homes and kill them. Just through the roof, no problem really. You know, hailstones do not fall uh, with one here and then another uh, 100, 100 yards away. It does not go there. Instead, hairs uh, uh, fall like rain. So, uh, uh, just uh, uh, think about such hailstones falling on people, cars, and homes. All of them will be destroyed. The destruction uh, caused by uh, the hailstones during this plague was so great that the passage talks about people's response about it, saying they cursed the God on account of what? On account of the plague of hail. I thought that they would curse God because of the plague of the earthquake, that biggest earthquake that has ever occurred. It seems they should have cursed God that way. But instead, they cursed God on account of the plague of hail. You can imagine how terrible it was because the plague was so terrible. Far worse than the earthquake. That's what happened. Again, they recognized that this plague was from God. Yet, instead of repenting and turning to God, they cursed God. They were really evil. In this seventh world plague, there was one special target, that is, the great city. Verse 19 reads, the great city split into three parts. What does this great city refer to? I asked this question during Bible study, and then the, uh, some disciples said, uh, Jerusalem. But actually, this is not Jerusalem, okay? The great city. God gives us some hint in verse 19 saying, God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Here, the great city refers to Babylon the Great, the adulterous woman, the great prostitute in Revelation chapter 17, referring to a religious group that was uh, uh, supposed to be a God-worshipping religion. She had committed adultery before God by loving and worshipping idols than God. This religious group is described here as the great city. Have you ever heard about any religion that is identified with a city? That is, only one, only one religious group that is associated with a city. It is the Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, which has its own jurisdiction in the Vatican. So the news media, uh, the, so the news media do not call this religious group as uh, do not call this religious group 
the Roman Catholic Church. They do not call it that way. Instead, the news media says, the Vatican says this. The Vatican says that. That's how they uh, describe it. In God's eyes, she has been doing terrible things for several thousand years. Then during the last part of the last days, during the seven ball place, this woman who has been in the world since the early reaches of human history will be finally destroyed and be gone from the, be gone from the earth forever. At this, heaven will rejoice. These seven bold plagues all bring disasters on a global scale, affecting the life of the uh, inhabitants of the earth. Indeed, it is God's wrath poured out on them. By the way, how long will it take for these seven plagues to be completed? How long will it take for these seven plagues to be completed? As we studied, the seven uh, seal plagues and the seven trumpet plagues will take so long. Maybe together two or even three decades. But these seven bold plagues will not take so long. Basically, these, these seven bold plagues will occur during the second half of the seven-year covenant. In chapter 13, the, during the second year, uh, uh, second, year uh, uh, second half of the seven year covenant, many things uh, will uh, uh, happen before the seven, uh, seven seal uh, plagues. In chapter 13, we see the Antichrist rising to power. That is the beginning of the second uh, half of the seven year covenant. Then the mark of the beast is issued. Then in chapter 14, we see 144,000 Jewish evangelists gathering in heaven with Jesus, showing that they were killed by the Antichrist. Then following their martyrdom, there was a major harvest of the saints under the persecution of the Antichrist. They will be killed also. Then there was another harvest of the wicked, so many people uh, 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 were killed on earth. Probably the 200 million soldiers who had killed one third of the mankind were killed uh, at that time. For these things to occur from the rise of the Antichrist, it might take how long? Maybe two, at least two years or three years. After all these, uh, uh, these things, then the seven ball plague will be plagues will be pulled out uh, and, uh, uh, before the end of the seven year uh, covenant. So we can imagine that for all these seven ball plagues to occur, it will take about one year or most likely less than one year. In this way, since these seven ball plagues are pulled out on the earth in a relatively short period of time, we can see that God's judgment has been intensified. Indeed, it will be a very difficult time for the inhabitants of the earth. We are waiting for Jesus' second coming. We now know how well the history will go and how eventually the, event, uh, the inhabitants of the earth will be punished. We must make sure that we will not be one of those uh, objects of God's wrath. We must make sure that we escape these things by having faith in Jesus. We must hold on to him absolutely no matter what. At the same time, we should not be arrogant or gloat over the, the destruction of the inhabitants of the earth. Instead, we must remember that 
we have our own duty to carry out as we wait for his second coming. Jesus says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. So it is not the time for us Christians to feel superior to the people in the world. It's not the time for us to have pride as Christians either. Instead, it is the time for us to sincerely seek God's will, repenting of all our sins in Jesus and striving to do what is right in God's eyes. That way, we'll be able to rejoice at Jesus' second coming welcoming him freely. We must struggle to live our life in a manner worthy of his coming. One word, blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, granting us today's message revealing uh, uh, how uh, uh, things will go and how we must prepare ourselves. We must not be just casual or just go through the motion. Instead, Lord, we must be keenly aware of, the, uh, aware of what we do and how we live our life as Christians. May you strengthen us, Lord, that we uh, uh, may stay awake uh, in all the situations and we may be found as those uh, uh, who uh, welcome Jesus freely, Lord. May you uh, bless us that uh, we may uh, uh, do what you want us to do in our day-to-day -day life. That way we may live our uh, uh, Christian life really. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing hymn 353. <laughs> offering.
Lord, Father, we just want to thank you so much for blessing us with a chance to study your words in a book of Revelations, showing and revealing to us what is to come. Help us, Lord, so that we can really take to heart everything you have said and revealed to us uh, through this passage. Lord, help us to stay awake and help us, Lord, to keep our clothes by doing what's right, by serving you wholeheartedly. Help us not to grow casual, Lord, but we may really continue to uh, live our lives worthy of your uh, calling and grace upon our lives. We also thank you so much, Lord, for this um, offering and your provisions. Lord, we pray that you may use it to further your kingdom and expand and to fulfill our prayer topic of teaching 400 one-to-one -one Bible studies, Lord, and establishing many more disciples, Lord. Um, we thank you uh, so much, Lord, and we lift everything in your hands. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We will now have prayer topics and announcements by Missionary John Beck. Hi, everyone. Uh, we thank God for uh, granting us uh, today's message. Uh, at first, uh, you know, when we uh, you know, just read a passage, uh, seems just uh, simple, uh, you know, just simple uh, uh, punishment uh, uh, because the passage does not elaborate uh, each uh, plague uh, in detail. Uh, but as we uh, meditate on uh, each uh, uh, plague, uh, we can see that indeed uh, these uh, seven plagues are really serious ones. God's uh, rest poured out. Uh, God's rest will be completed with these seven plagues. We can really understand. Uh, so things will go uh, this way. Uh, uh, so let's uh, uh, not uh, be deceived by uh, uh, glamorous looking things of uh, this world. Uh, uh, we don't want to be a part of uh, the world. Uh, instead, we would uh, live as God's people, uh, really, so that uh, uh, we will not be a part of God's, uh, uh, part of, uh, uh, the, we will not uh, partake uh, in this uh, judgment. Uh, so we must make sure that uh, we must have faith in Jesus. And then it, might, it must not be just a conceptual or religious instead of one. Uh, we must stay awake and uh, keep our clothes with us. That kind of Christian life we must live. Life challenges are there and difficulties rise. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, make sure that you will not be destroyed by those things. You will remain uh, in Jesus to the end. And then as you remain in Jesus, you stay uh, awake and then, uh, keep your clothes with you. But that, uh, that way, that kind of Christian life we live. This is what Jesus wants us to do. Uh, let's uh, keep praying for uh, our Bible studies and worship services on the book of uh, Revelation that uh, each uh, week God's divine uh, revelation may be given to us. Uh, let's uh, also pray for 400 one-tone Bible studies and 200 uh, disciples this year and also for uh, uh, our sick people and then the world as well. Uh, 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 let's uh, uh, stand and sing uh, the Lord's Prayer together and dismiss this worship service. <clears throat> Thank you. 